Okay, let me share my screen with you uh, with a bit of uh, a, a slideshow about uh, blog writing in B2B. Let me open up the chat window so that I can see that as well. Uh, and also the participant list. So hopefully I can see if you put your hands up. There are so many windows to have open. Uh, cool. Um, blog writing is something that I think often gets overlooked, but it, it's changed a lot um, over the last few years. The length of the average blog has got longer and longer. People are investing more and more in creating better and better content. Um, where once upon a time it used to be just kind of SEO filler for a lot of brands. I think people are taking it very seriously as a kind of a um, kind of flexible and um, useful way to self-publish effectively. Um, so, as I say, if you want to continue the conversation then uh by all means do so outside of this forum you can find us on twitter at radixcom if you want to use b2b tuesdays as a hashtag then feel free but you know you don't have to um and uh so there'll be a, a short presentation now and then after that we'll open it up and have a q a on really any kind of uh, aspect of b2b content writing that you like um and um, obviously, I'm as much, you know, interested in hearing from other people in the group and you talking amongst uh, yourselves um, and um, as much as uh, uh, as hearing from me. Um, cool. Got a question already from from Yvonne. Excellent. Um, Yvonne, I'm this is quite a long question. Are you all right f if I allow you to uh, to talk on the on the microphone and then you can kind of phrase the question your own way and then people can hear you and it's not all my voice? Is that cool? Uh, so I've, I've I've clicked you on there, kind of allow you you're able to take yourself off mute if you'd like to. Yvonne, hi, welcome. Hello, David. Hi, nice to uh, nice to, nice to hear your voice, having seen you on LinkedIn forever. How are things? Oh, they're good. They're good. Yeah, I, I realised my question was super long, and it's actually about content that is super long, which is ironic as well. <laughs> well, cool. That 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 works. So yeah, um, I mean, if you can kind of share the uh, the question with the uh, uh, with the group. Yeah. So what, what was guess, it that you had? Yeah, I guess I work a lot with um, industrial and technology companies. And there can be a really common tendency to produce blogs and articles that are super, super long, like 5,000 words even, because they're trying to cover often quite complex or technical topics, um, which require a lot of detail. And to try to kind of steer them away from that because they're, they're not so consumable, <clears throat> we tend to recommend that um, try to break those article, articles up into series so at least they are that bit more consumable but I wonder what other approaches or series you would recommend um, for you know diverting away from those kind of super super long pieces. Absolutely uh, thanks for that Yvonne. Um, um, yeah I'll um, I don't know if I'm not sure how this works take back control as they say um, so uh thank you for that um i think um that from my point of view it's always about the you know i'm not a marketing strategist i'm a i'm a content writer um but from my point of view it's always about someone has to represent the customer um someone has to represent the user the prospect whoever whoever's going to read the thing um and i'm not necessarily going to say that 5000 a 5000 word article is flat wrong like i've i've uh, there are some really good long reads on the internet and they go really deep um and um blog posts of 2 or 3000 words certainly are pretty common now like a 2 and a half thousand word blog post is as common as a 500 word blog post according to i think orbit media um so um from that point of view, uh, you know, it, it, 
if it's realistic that the reader will sit down and read it all, that might be a thing. Um, and similarly, if you've got some structure within it so that people can click to the right bits and do some um, do some heavy lifting, then that's, uh, you know, or that the structure will do the heavy lifting so people can, um, uh, uh, can scan it quite easily and get to the bit that they need quite easily. Um, I think that that, that that makes sense um but yeah I, I my approach would be i think to ask the client about how they um how they view people saying well this is the length of time this will take to read how do you view people are people going to sit at their desk and read it from start to finish are people going to dip into it is there another way that we can do that so it could be a linked series of articles if they if there is a thing where they think people will write it um well will some people will read it all in one go one of the things that we did for danfoss was that we wrote a series effectively a series of like 800 to a thousand word blog posts and then we wrapped them up into an ebook so that you've got a longer asset and that's made up of a series of short standalone articles so that you can read it a bit of it or you can read all of it up to you you know, and then there are other ways, like if you don't like PDFs, there are other ways you can do that. So um, I know it, it is, it's not for for everyone, but we've had particularly good experience working with Turtle um, and their stuff is quite, you know, you, you can break that content down and then analyze who went to which bits, which then gives you the data. I think these conversations, it's always important not to bring um, opinions to a, a data fight. So I'd see if you can show them um yeah uh, factual information about this is how long people are spending on the pages on your website this is how long the average reader has this is how this is how long it takes to read a 5000 word article um and go from th that point of view so that it's a bit more third party does that uh i'll put the, the the mic back on is that does that sort of help Yvonne yeah i think it's that line about the length of time this will take would really help where it kind of steer opening up the conversation to look at other outlets and definitely um, that kind of idea of not only breaking uh, long pieces up into a series but even you know a short version and make the long version maybe available as a takeaway pdf or something just that it's not forced upon to consume the, you know 20 minute long five six seven thousand word piece absolutely and when you atomize like that you know the nice thing about it is you've got this big long asset but then you can go, you can do by the sound of it four five six spin off pieces that can each go out on their own into the internet and social media and exactly. promote the promote the other piece yeah exactly okay cool uh, thanks very much uh, for that Yvonne let's uh, push on with the uh, a, a quick uh, a quick presentation uh, and this will be pretty short you may have your own ideas and things to uh, to add but I did promise some hints and tips on blog writing so as of March 19 I think there were 4.4 million blog posts published on the internet every day now obviously not all of those are in your sector not all of them are in B2B but nonetheless you've got to write blogs in a way that stand out and I think you've got to do four things really clearly for me you've got to be really clear about who your audience is really clear what value they will get from reading really clear about how you will sound um, and then you've got to make those things clear uh, in the title and the introduction and the way that you you start reading I think for me in blog posts the start is like 90% of it so ask yourself who is your audience and specifically who is not your audience so in the, if the subject that you are in the subject you are addressing if you are writing to everybody or an entire sector or all of the CIOs in the world or something probably that's not realistic you could resonate more by focusing otherwise you know this is a, a, a real example from, from the internet you know a guide for project-based manufacturers and secrets for software buyers if I'm either one of those people I'm not going to be interested because it's not all about me you know and, and where people have limited time they'll engage with things that are clearly about them and are relevant to their interests so this is something where you know this is really hyper specific 
guy is a world expert on um, uh, on securing uh, positioning navigation technology, effectively making sure you can't hack your GPS. Um, you know, and it's really specific, you know, the GPS network, this is so specific in terms of the technicalities and how to tell if your number, your receivers are effective. This is so clearly aimed at engineers with a really, really niche specialism. But amongst those people, it really resonated because it was very clear who it was for. And then it went round within that community. Um, and so the, the people in that community know Guy very well. It does this kind of thing. It's this level of specific. Um, or this is something uh, that we were, wrote, I think, you know, we were working with, with Instant, on, uh, Instant on IT. And they, as part of their business, they work with uh, legal chambers, like barristers' chambers. And so instead of specifically, you know, broadly writing a piece about the end of server support, you know, the end of support for Windows Server 2008, um, they knew that this was their target market. So they wrote a thing for people who run IT in barristers chambers about what the end of Windows Server 2008 needs for you. Now that's really super specific. Um, but if I'm that IT manager, I'm more likely to read this than I am a, a general piece that might or might not um, affect me because within here, they can talk about the, the applications that are commonly, commonly used in the legal sector um, uh, with, with this kind of infrastructure. Okay, so then ask yourself, those readers, what will they get by reading? You know, why should they spend their time? Um, you know, so uh, Sophos do, uh, you know, like five different security updates a day. Now, if you're an IT cybersecurity professional, you know, they're very clear, um, you know, what you are going to get when you, uh, when you read their, their content. There's a utility to it. There's a value to it. You know, similarly, like it could be advice, it could be information, or it could be like a thing that you can actually use. You know, so that's information, then you've got utility. So something that we do on, on, on Rack, so we've got a blog post that teaches you how to write a blog post. And literally it goes, paragraph one, you do this, paragraph two, you do that, paragraph three, you do that. And it's absolutely, and it's the same with our checklist, that it actually has a utility value that if you're sitting there with a cursor blinking at you and you've got to write a blog post, it physically makes it easier for you. So it's that kind of utility for your um, for your audience. Um, similarly, you know, sprint small business um, business owners weigh in on the best internal team collaboration apps. You know what you're going to get when you read this. You're going to get the reviews of other business owners like you about which apps worked best for them. So the value is right it is up front, uh, you know, and it is. It's not a salesy thing. It is independent. It involves other people. The other thing that is nice about this, um, that um, that works really well on 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 Sprint small business, is that they have a really clear. If you look at the bottom of the page here, they have a really clear voice and tone that that, that they use. You know, um, internal comms. It's one of those catch-all phrases that covers everything. Like, want to grab lunch? You know, that kind of thing. Like, they are compared to their competitors in their market, they have this really informal tone that talks very directly to people in small business. Very interestingly, Sprint's voice will change slightly whether they're talking to a bigger business, an enterprise or a small business. So think about how you will sound. You know, the, the classic one, I don't even need to tell you who wrote this. You know, like you'll, you'll, you'll get down and go, oh yeah, this is the, you know, be reading a little bit into this, particularly when you get into the sweary bit at the bottom and you'll go, all oh, right, yeah, that's the, um, uh, that's the latest blog post from Doug Kessler at Velocity Partners, because it sounds like Doug, um, you know, and, um, you know, and, and it's that thing where one of the ways you can differentiate yourself, like there's a lot of content about, don't use cliches during a time of during the time of coronavirus. Just stop saying uncertain. Stop saying unprecedented. A lot of people are saying that, but Doug's here saying it. Velocity is saying it in a very forthright way that is much more entertaining and interesting to to read than the normal dry stuff. So they are, as well as giving really good advice, differentiated by their voice, differentiated by how they sound. 
So you've got the audience, you've got the value, you've got how you sound. The trick now is show all of that right at the start so that before people invest any time, it's very clear to them, you know, why they should, um, why they should read both at the start of the piece where they Google on in that, you know, that, okay, am I going to hit back on my browser or am I going to read this? Similarly, a lot of the time when something is shared on social, it's the first bits of, it's the first bits of the content that you see. It's the title. It's the first couple of lines. So those really have to set your, your stall out. So here, uh, this is uh, from a blog uh, a few years ago by a company called Voxgen, who do uh, IVR, you know, press one for this, press two for that. Um, and, you know, the house small data can make a huge difference to your IVR experience, sets out what, it, what it's about. Then, you know, this bit in red, customers are happier when brands know that what they want and tailor the service accordingly. It's easier than you think to make it happen with your IVR. You know exactly, this is your nutshell paragraph. Most important thing you can do in B2B content writing, in my view, is learn to write a good nutshell. You know, two lines, you know exactly what you're going to get from this blog post, but then it twists. Yeah, and then the actual start of the content is, it's a cold, wet evening in February, and suddenly it's telling a story. And that's great, but it set the you know, and, you're draw and it draws you in and it, it tells you this whole story about going shopping because you've lost a birthday present. Um, but you're already invested in it because you kind of know what the subject is and then it can jump right in. It's a similar thing I did in a blog post that I wrote for B2B Marketing, where it actually starts, the tiny silver spacecraft flees across the screen surrounded by laser fire. For a thing on B2B Marketing, like, oh, why is that? But it's about how um, things don't always start the way that you think. But it's enabled to do that because it sets out, you know, it's about B2B storytelling and it's about a beginning, a middle, and end. So people's expectations are set very clearly. Very, here, very clearly, it's about storytelling. Very, it's about B2B stories. It says that I'm a copywriter, so it's going to be about content writing. So it's set the ground out very clearly and then the start of the story takes them off in an unexpected um, direction and pulls them into the piece. So the start of the story is very clear. So be clear about the audience, be clear about the value, do it in a way that is creative and sounds different and signal all of that at the start. Those for me are, I think, the four essential bits of uh, B2B blog writing but it may be that you have more questions or you have more views. There is so much to be said about <laughs> blog writing and I didn't want to take the whole time talking because I wanted to give you um, an opportunity. So um, let me stop that share so that I can see the, uh, the chat panel um, and, uh, and everything else. Um, Guys, how have you got any thoughts, any questions, any tips of your own on what you think makes a good B2B blog post? Uh, Kerry says, hi. Hi, Kerry. Um, Kerry, do you want me to, have you a question or something? Do you want me to open the microphone so that you can say hello? Would that be cool? Can you explain a bit more about the, the three act structure? Okay, so Kerry's question here. Can you explain a bit more about the three act structure? Well, yes, but we only have a, have a few minutes. Um, so the three act structure is one of the most kind of basic aspects of storytelling. So it's the classic thing where you say a story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And when we are growing up, we learn um, that stories have a certain shape. And so stories, um, ha uh, things that follow what we expect kind of feel familiar and they feel satisfying and you're aware that something comes to a, uh, a conclusion. However, um, you don't always have to do those things in that order or the way that you think. But generally speaking, like if you follow uh, that structure, it starts. So in the first quarter, the first 25% of the, 
you will find you build the world, you introduce the main character, something happens, an inciting incident that the, that the hero has to respond to. And at the, about the 25% mark, the hero will go out into a new world. So about a quarter of the way through Star Wars, Millennium Falcon blasts its way out of Mos Eisley. And for the first time, Luke Skywalker is off Tatooine. Okay. The middle half, if you like, from the 25% to the 75% mark, you get a series of, um, of increasing um, of, uh, kind of conflicts or challenges, increasing stakes, increasing levels of difficulty in most stories. Normally around the 50% mark, about halfway through, there's an oh shit moment where, where you think the prob- there's a twist, where you think what the problem was the problem isn't. So if you go to the original Star Wars, find the exact halfway mark. It's exactly when Obi-Wan Kenobi says, that's not a moon, that's a space station. So anyway, so that all comes up and, and sort of somewhere after the twist, it might look like the hero is lost. That often happens in that kind of 50 to 75% of the way through. Three quarters of the way through, the hero fights back, finds a new plan, um, goes after the uh goes after the bad guy in a new way so it's the classic bit where like in the matrix neo decides he's going to take the fight to the smiths and he's actually going to attack the office block and get morpheus back right you have a do or die moment um in the final 25 percent uh usually the hero wins and then you go back in that last 25 percent to see how the world has changed now as a result of everything that has happened um so um you know and then so usually the classic one for me there is the scouring of the shire at the end of the lord of the rings where the hobbits go back and saruman and worm tongue and that are all in the um you know they're they're all in the shire and they've taken over and the hobbits who at the start were small and scared just kicked them out just go yeah right you know and saruman i think saruman looks at frodo and says you know you have grown master hobbit you've grown indeed or something like that and it's it's that point you know they have been changed by their journey and the world has changed so it's you kind of come full circle but it's full circle but different the end of the story and that's it that's sort of how that works um i hope that uh i hope that helps uh bill has his hand up so uh bill i will i will come to you hang on there you are. Right. Hi, Bill. How are you? Hi, David. I'm good. Can you hear me? I can. I can. I can hear you. I hope everyone else can hear you. Um, but I certainly, I certainly can. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted some advice. Um, a lot of blogs that I read, uh, sometimes they're quite long. And often, maybe um, because it's a more informal way of engaging with the audience than other pieces, often uh, there's very little in the way of obvious structure or subheadings or whatever. Mm. And I'm quite a logical thinker. So for me, I kind of think, would it actually make it more quick, scannable, readable to to have some subheadings and what have you in there? There's also possibly a a little bit of a potential SEO win as well in doing that. But I just wondered whether you, you think there's some general rights or wrongs to that discussion. Great. Cool. Thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, from my point of view, um, good subheadings and regular subheadings are an absolute win, um, both from an SEO point of view, as you said, um, but also from the point of view of, of, of making it scannable so you can get to the bit that you need uh, and, and, and do it quickly. The other thing is, if your um, if your subheadings, if you can make them so that instead of just describing the content that is underneath you can make them summarize or interpret the content that's underneath that way if somebody only scans down the page and never reads the full content only reads the subheads they will get the story and you can actually deliver some value so i like to make sure that the subheads have some value to them um as you said you can also use it for seo and signaling to web users that you you know that you are answering a particular question um that they have in mind often a nice way to to do it um 
can be if you're using like the function the questions function uh, in Google searches and looking at the questions people search around a topic those questions can also become your uh, your subheads and if you do a really nice pithy answer on quite a niche thing after it you could uh, in the end get picked up by Google for those no-click searches where Google pulls your content up as the authoritative voice on a question. Um, we have a few of those for Radix. So like if you search for Google for what are the types of copywriter, they'll pull the content straight in out of the, the Radix site. But yeah, I mean, subheadings are like, they are much more likely to be read than the rest of your content. So why would you not include them, right? I, I, does that... But yeah, always, um, I, I would very rarely write something of any length without, without subheads. Does that, does that help, Bill? Does that sort of answer or add anything? I think the short answer is I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, good. No, I'm, I'm just reassured by that because that's my gut feeling. But I see, I see a lot of blogs where that isn't the case. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a piece that I wrote on B2B marketing about... So if you need anything to help you make the argument to other people, um, there's a, a piece that I wrote on B2B marketing about does your blog post or does your content pass the five second test? Um, so if you search B2B marketing, David McGuire, five seconds on Google, that will probably come up and that might help. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. We're getting on for five o'clock now. I'm happy to stay and chat and answer questions for uh, for as long as you like. Um, so we can certainly continue with that. Um, what I will say is if uh, next week I've decided to finally bite the bullet and talk about how you write um, <laughs> how you write content in an apocalypse, I think. But no, you know, how, how you change your content for a, a COVID-19 19 world and you know in particular now that things are beginning to open up a bit what are some of the things that maybe we want to be careful of now because i don't think we're quite going back to normal but that will be something where i don't have research on that right so that will be quite a, a subjective point of view from me so that'll be something where i'll be really keen to hear what you guys have to say um and what your thoughts are on that and that hopefully be something that's more of a uh, a, a group discussion um so that's five uh, so it'd be great to see you there if you need to go then that's that's cool because we said it'd be half an hour however i will continue to, to stay and answer questions in the chat or on thing on an, i see that uh that amelie has uh, has her hand up as well uh so we'll come to amelie and answer a uh, a question or or hear a hear a point uh hi amelie hi, hi where, where are you calling in from uh from berlin Oh wow! Fan, fan, fantastic. How 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 are thing how are things there? We um, uh, in our news, which I know isn't always a good um, a good uh, uh, barometer of things, but things seem a lot less messed up in Germany than they are here. I'm not quite sure about it, to be honest. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> the numbers will show. Like in two weeks, we'll know more about it. I don't sure. know. Absolutely. But but anyway, yeah. Thank you for. Um, Thank you for, for for coming along. I hope that you're managing to keep safe and well. I hope so too. No, we're <laughs> social social distancing. Uh, well, everyone is at home working, flattening the curve. Cool, so doing that, and you're doing the mask thing and all of that as well. All of that, yes. <laughs> cool. Anyway, what was your point, or what was? The um, thanks for doing this. By the way, I wanted to thank you for oh, giving thanks. us the opportunity to ask you questions. And... No, absolutely. Um, no, it's good to. It's, it, particularly at the, I mean, it's always good to connect, but especially now, right? That is so true, particularly in the same, you know, we're all in the same content boat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I've got a question. I recently started a new position um, with a machine manufacturer producing software as a service with AI, deep tech, data science, and I can never bring the readability scores and all the tools down or up, depending on sure. like how. It's in, we do have an um, expert audience but I have the impression whatever our people want in the, in the posts we're publishing is not really relevant for people on the other side who read this. And I yeah. can never get the readability to a level where I would like it to be. So is that, that is it that 
with the content that you need to talk about, you can't get the readability, you know, it's physically impossible to get the readability level where you want it to be. Or is it that you know what you would like to do, but your stakeholders won't accept it? Uh, it's the first one. I can't get okay. the readability down because we just have so many technical terms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like ha describe artificial intelligence. <laughs> sure. In easy terms. Go yeah. ahead. Without patronizing people. <laughs> yeah, not today. Um, Good. But um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think, hang on, let me, let me do a screen share if I can, if I can find it. Um, Hold on. Um, thank you for that. Hang on. Let's do. Let's do this. Um, hang on. Pump, uh, pump, parts. None of those. B two B marketing. There. So there's a piece called here called the clear case for simpler B two B content. So this is more about how to win arguments with your stakeholders. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but there's a, a bit in here, you know, there's a bit in here about the readability algorithms and, um, and, uh, and things, but, uh, so that might be helpful. Um, but I think that the, the point I make when I'm a copywriting training is that there are three, three aspects to, uh, to complexity and content technical specificity is only one of them so what you need to do i think is balance out with the non-technical terms so i think the point that i would i'd make it i may have made it in one of these before is that if you go to a um if you go and stand by a water cooler in a uh, where your engineers are where your experts are you know and there's and there's a problem you know the, so they will use very, very specific technical terms, but the language that they put it in will be quite simple. So, you know, they'll go, oh, the, you know, the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the vintage transmogrifier is, is broken again. And then someone will go, yeah, that's, uh, that's always get that's always getting stuck. You know, toggle the, uh, toggle the hazmat switch or something, you know, and, and, and so they'll talk in quite short sentences. And so where you're talking about something quite specific, and, 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 and I tend to find that the more complex the subject, really the more simple, if you can, to make the writing. Um, so when you look at the readability, the vocabulary that you use is only one part of the equation like the rest you've got like sentence structure um and then the other language you know that you use so or the more technical the content is and the more of these long words you have if you're aiming for readability um then a lot of it is kind of going through making sure the sentence structure you know you're not using passive sentence structure you're not using nominalized verbs you're not using really long words that aren't part of those particular technical specifics and also that you're not using really long list heavy multi-clause sentences keep that sentence length down you know like if you can keep because the, to most readability algorithms it's the length of the words or how common the words are and it's the length of the sentences so try and get it in quite simple sentences the, the good news for you is that it is um, quite good practice. So I got to a point where I was doing um, CRM integration and digital transformation subjects for an audience that were not primarily English speakers. And the client wanted me to achieve a flesh Kincaid grade level of seven to eight. So in the UK terms, that's, uh, that's 11 and 12 year olds. Um, and practicing doing that in the end it was it was possible but it was making being very aware of the technical specifics and putting short sentences um, around it so that the sentence structure isn't too hard to follow does that help or not really uh, it does help a lot I also try <laughs> 
uh, I'm never going to go for perfect because it just sure. kills productivity. But um, I generally also, if I have like list sentences, I just break them up into lists, to be honest, like bullet points. Yeah. Just to make the content accessible also for just skim reading. Absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, bullet, bullet points are great, you know, and, and I think that it's, it's those things about really looking at the, the, the content and asking yourself which, you know, which parts are words that there are more simpler words and which parts are technical words where there are no simpler words. Um, you know, and how, how short and easy can I make, can I split the sentence into two? Can I split it into three? So it's one idea per sentence um, and really, you know, simplifying that almost to balance out the complexity of the, of, of the subject matter. It is a, um, it is a, a tricky one. What, um, what readability um, measure are you using? Um, since I also do SEO, I work with search metrics. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know search metrics very well, but one of the things that you, that you can play with is that there are editors. There's one, um, called, uh, readable, I think it's, it's like app.readable.com slash text. I think it is. Um, and that's one that I've started using quite recently because for training and things, because it's really good. You know, when you put it up, it actually highlights long sentences. It highlights complicated words so you can visually see where to focus your time so that oh, might be brilliant. that might be quite fun just to play with and see if it highlights something for you that you were missing and going oh yeah my sentences are all 50 words long or you know or whatever it is in case there's a blind spot for you that might surface it yeah i, I also use grammarly the free version so it tells you like hey your readability score cool. you're like a three out of a hundred it's like oh okay cool <laughs> I, I i started using grammarly um but it um uh yeah it, it just annoyed me so much that in the end i just had to kind of switch it off I yeah the add-on I, I, I is couldn't, awful i couldn't live with it i you know when it was in when it was in my outlook telling me you know, um, yeah. pointing out mistakes and everything. I, I, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't live with Grammarly. Uh, and, well, I know lots of copywriters do uh, and, and find that really interesting. But what, but those, there are lots of nice websites and apps now that, that will actually highlight things. A lot of people use a Hemingway editor. A lot of people, I think, overuse the Hemingway. There's an editor called Hemingway. Yeah, I've and heard again, about it. And I used similar, it. Similar thing, you know, but I think it, it, it's mostly just playing with editors and things and seeing what it surfaces for you yeah okay I generally give them like specific tasks like i have a bad feeling about this go to will make it better <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay thank, thanks thanks cool. this is really helpful no thank you thank you for uh thank you for coming it's um you know it, it's great to uh it's great to hear from you always good to have an, an international audience uh, uh as well uh, uh thanks very much uh, we have a uh, a question from uh, Zdenka on. Uh, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. On uh, how do you fight multilingual blogs? Uh, and I don't know what you quite mean in the sense of of how I would how or why I would fight them. Um, did you want to? Um, if I open your your microphone here, is that something that you could? Uh, tell me about what you mean by fighting a multilingual blog. Oh, sorry, I think I might have unmuted you just as you did, and then. Unmuted. Ah, there we are. Hello, hi. Oh, hi. How... How are you? Thank you. Uh, thank you for for coming along and and for the the question. What was the? In what way are, are you fighting multilingual blogs? Okay, the thing is that if I write content in one language and then I have to translate it, it sometimes it doesn't have the same um, tones, the same tone, and so. So, how what do you recommend if you have to publish content in more languages? Um, thanks. Um, it is really difficult. Uh, is the is the, the the short answer? There are a number of ways you can do it um and the 
uh, and it and it kind of depends on the company that you work with and the budget that that that, that you have to play with. On I've so on one hand, I'll give you the two extremes. Okay, on one hand, we often work with or sometimes, thankfully, less often than we did. We work with companies where the content is going to be uh, delivered uh, multilingually. Um, and they ask us to leave out any humor, leave out any uh, idioms or any uh, language that is, you know, kind of illustrative language or imagery because those things often you know things that often don't translate you know so just because you know there's a just because the phrase means it's a piece of cake you know in english something could be a piece of cake in polish it might not be um you know and, and so to translate that literally would be weird and so they ask us to do that you when, when people ask us to do that usually our interpretation is that they're probably going to uh deliver that with a um you know with effectively google translate or something very like it it's going to be robot translation or something where they particularly something they want to go on a kind of a very low cost translation so one option is to keep it really really factual to keep it really really plain and take as much style out as you can the other example at the far other end the most complex that i've seen is that i used to write uh, content for a forklift truck website and that would be something where uh we would write it in english i have to try and get this right we would write it in english it would be uh it would be tran translated by a specific technical translator into the target language um it would then be reviewed by a forklift truck dealer in that company in that country to check that the points we were making were still the right points having had it translated that nothing was um, then out of step with what their sales message would be uh, and then it was edited by a journalist in the target language uh, to check that the uh, the forklift truck dealer who wasn't a, a writer um, hadn't introduced grammar errors in mistakes and inconsistencies so there was like a four stage um a four stage uh process but that was for something that was really quite technical in between we've seen something where um most uh translation companies can do an element of trans creation so if it's a human translator and i say something is a piece of cake they will know what the polish version is of saying piece of cake or german which might not be literally a piece of cake but there will probably be a phrase that you know that means it's easy in a colloquial way and they'll use that because they understand that and then that's more about that kind of writing is more about when you do the ux making sure you know because other languages use more letters than english making sure there's more space and that kind of thing um and things that where they have a translation system that uses fuzzy fuzzy logic it's about not using very many in english we use very many synonyms to say the same thing we don't like repeating ourselves but the more synonyms you use the more expensive it is so that's a lot about training yourself when you say something and then you refer to it in future to mean the same thing to use exactly the same words um so that's somewhere in between the two that's like a slightly stylized way of writing that is slightly simpler slightly more repetitive but without taking out all of the the Id idioms and the uh and the imagery um does that sort of help yes great thank you uh, yeah. also some, some, somewhere in between these two ways so sure yeah it, it is it is tricky um and the other thing that i would advise as a, as a content writer is keep an open dialogue with if it's a human doing the translation keep an open dialogue with the human doing the translation um you know and check that you know and, and check that out um you know and then maybe and or maybe then have it read by a subject matter expert in the target language whether they are a someone in the organization that you work with or a 
a, a trade journalist in that sector or something like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your question and for, uh, for coming along. Um, cool. Does anyone, if anyone, unless anyone has any more questions, I'm going to, because we're way over time for today, but that's fine. If you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them or we can, uh, we, we can call it a day and I will um, hopefully see you in a week's time. I'll just give you a few seconds. Okay, cool. I think what I'll say is um, let's call a halt to this for, for today. Thank you so much for coming. It was great to actually hear some people's voices today. That was really super. Uh, and to get such an international audience as well. That was awesome. Um, hope to see you uh, next week for another chat. Please do uh, keep yourself safe. Uh, you know, look after yourself, uh, look after your, your loved ones, do all the, the right things that the scientists are advising us all to do, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure you will. Um, and we will, we're thinking about, um, we've got the videos of these, and we're thinking about putting them up on YouTube. Um, if everyone is happy with that, just to enable people who aren't, um, uh, who aren't able to make it to them. So we have people from Australia that want to join in and that kind of thing. Um, so, so if you want to recap at any point uh, or you've missed a week, then, uh, then those will be up on, uh, uh, on keeping on the social media and, and we'll let you know when they're there. But thank you anyway, so much for coming. Uh, do take care and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.